Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming inside. I know it's easier to be out. It's easier to be under the sky. But every once in a while, we have to gather, right? We have to get under a roof just for a moment to share stories. I drove up with my, with my teenage kid today from Grand Junction, Colorado. And maybe I shouldn't focus on the traffic and the vehicles and the lines and lines of people, all of us streaming every which direction because I have to admit I prefer my civilization's ancient. <laughs> I like to come to civilization, but there is something about the older that matters more. This lair that we live in right now is, is just such a thin veneer. And it's such a busy veneer. So much speed and light and action. And, and sometimes it's easier to sit with a pop shirt on the ground or to look at a painting on a cliff wall that's 4,000 years old and to think back to another time because we're all from that other time, if you think about it. All of our ancestors came from the ground, different sides of the planet, different continents, different languages, but all ancestors came from the ground. Today on the, on the drive out, we needed to stretch our legs a bit and we, we pulled off on a road up into the book cliffs and, and uh, just uh, it's kind of a random spot, but you know, spots are never random. You always choose them for a reason. Pulled off on the side of, a, of this, this pothole, two lane, and, uh, and just a place where the, the cliffs looked right. They, they came in close enough that, that you could get up to them through a, a couple hundred feet of boulders, and, and, uh, and my kid was wearing flip flops. As we as we climbed up, and of course, as we usually do, we just we split off and went our own ways heading up there. And there was something about the place, the way that it was angled, how when we called to each other from below, we could hear our voices bouncing back from up in the cliffs. Something unique about it. Maybe there's always a reason that we go places, that, that we are following footsteps that came before us, even if we don't know it. When I got up uh, probably 200 feet up into, into the boulders, I saw a red circle painted on the rock with lines coming out from around it, and then another red circle next to it. And I looked down and, and saw Jado down below me, and he was sitting on a, a big house-sized boulder just looking out over the, over the valley below. And I, I said, hey, come up here, and uh, you gotta check something out. And he gave me that look that, that uh, you get from a teenager who's found his right spot. And, and he, he said, no, I'm, I'm in a good place here. And I said, no, no, you gotta come up and check something out. And so he scrambled up behind me, and, and uh, right when he got below me, he said, you mean those, those red circles? Yeah, I saw those. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I like that. <laughs> I, like, I mean, it's, encountering rock art is, is a magical experience. Uh, you know, it, you, you see through time, you see the, the hand of somebody marked on a wall from from what, a thousand years ago, two, three thousand years ago. But at the same time, it's just part of this landscape. It's just something else you see when you're out there. It's, I, I, raising kids on the Colorado Plateau, I, I wanted them to just know that this is written all around us. That this is just part of this place. And we walked along the base of the cliff and we saw more images, more circles along the way. Uh, he spotted a, a, a white painted circle up high and, and then I ducked under a, a little alcove and there, there were all these, uh, all these images, these, these kind of rainbow petroglyphs with, with human forms painted in underneath them and pecked into the rock. I, just 
to get the nomenclature out of the way, a petroglyph, as probably most of you know, is, is pecked into the rock. So it's pecked through the patina. So there's a darker patina on the outside and it reveals the, the fresh skin of the rock inside, which is much brighter. And a pictograph is painted onto the surface. Just to pull off the road and take a walk and find rock art gives you an idea of what's out there. Then in some ways it's everywhere. I mean, there are so many rock faces that, that look like they should have rock art, and you just, you pause there and you go, there, somebody should have done something here, right? <laughs> and there's nothing. That's because they're in very particular places. You get to a rock art panel, and, and you look at it, you study its, its figures, you make contact with it, maybe you say hello to it, or maybe you don't say anything at all. But you also turn around and look at everything else around it. Rock art is so much more than just the image on the rock, it's the place. While I was writing Tracing Time, I went out with, with, a, uh, with a Hopi Bear Clan society priest named Micah Lomaomboya, and, and we went to a, a panel in northern Arizona, a, a Hopi clan panel, uh, actually a series of boulders covered with, I think, about 2,000 petroglyphs, images just, just all over the rocks. And, and he looked at the, I, I looked at these images and I see you know, enigmatic figures that I can't define and, and he would look at it and go, oh, I know all these. I know these families, I know these clans, uh, the, and the way the clans are related to each other, the way they're put on the rock tells a story about who emerged from the Sipa, who first, and who came second, and how those stories unfolded. And I said, okay, why here in this spot? If you go a mile that direction, there is no rock art, and a mile that direction, no rock art, and there are thousands right here. And he said, well, there's a spring right up underneath that, that, that rim up there, and it's a spring where you can gather water. And this site is along a pilgrimage route used by Hopi and Zuni ancestrally to get to the Grand Canyon to gather salt. So this is a salt pilgrimage that comes through here. And so learning that, I saw that, oh, there's a reason for it to be here, which you can apply to any rock art site. You may not know about the pilgrimage that was there a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago, or you may not know about a spring that once flowed, but there's always a reason for these to be in these places. This rock art that we found in the book cliffs was one of so many. This landscape is an open book, and there are stories written in the rock. These are stories of ancestry. These are stories of first people, of the seniority on this landscape. We think of land sometimes in a sense of ownership, the paperwork, the deeds that are on the land, and you sell and buy land and trade the deeds. These deeds are written in stone. These are the oldest deeds in the land. Whenever you are there, pay attention to everything around you. Pay attention to the light, the way it comes through, the sound. So many of these sites are acoustic. Have you ever gone out and, and, just, and found rock art by clapping your hands? You walk in the Grand Canyon and clap and listen for the bounce back and follow it, and you might find rock art there. There was a researcher in a canyon here in Utah that, that walked up the canyon snapping a rat trap and recording it, and wherever there was a spike in the echo, he went back and checked those places, and there was always rock art at those spikes. The acoustic properties really matter. That particular canyon, I went into an alcove that had rock art and some friends of mine went into another alcove out of sight about a quarter mile away that had rock art and we talked back and forth our voices echoing from wall to wall connecting us there are so many different features to pay attention to here listen smell touch touch the ground feel it under your feet Listen to the way 
your voice echoes as you walk through a canyon. Tonight, we have something really special, and that's uh, that Kate McLeod is going to come up here. And let's give her a hand. Speaking of acoustics, I think it's important to, to lift out of words and get out of pages of a book and actually be present in a place where you can hear. So listen. Listen to the sound, the sound of the landscape, the desert around you. with my right foot. I move through this landscape as a human, as a person with hands and feet and eyes. They were always people. The people who left these marks were people like us. You see their handprints on the wall, and they are these hands, the hands of humans. You sit at these rock art sites and watch them for hours, for days. You come back again and again. That's why I wrote this book, was to say, spend time, slow down. 
sit in front of these and watch the light change across them. You'll notice that as the sun moves, rock art seems to move with it as if turning its head, watching the sun cross the sky. Every hour is different. Every minute is different. Come on December at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and the light becomes theatrical. Petroglyphs jump out as if made with neon. Come at sunrise. In fact, I recommend you come before dawn when the stars are still out. I wrote this book uh, and most, most of it occurred in 2020, some in 2021 and, and the, uh, I guess in a way this is, this is my pandemic book. What I did for the, for the pandemic where I spent more time with rock art than I did with living, breathing humans. I went back to the same places again and again and watched. And it's amazing how you'll know a panel really well. You'll, you'll have studied it inside and out, drawn it, written about it, taken pictures and sat for so many hours. There's one in Colorado near where I live that, that I would go up and visit and, and I, I felt like I knew everything about it. It didn't have that many characters, maybe, maybe 50 characters on a wall. And I thought I knew every single one of them. And then on a December day, in fact, it was, it was, uh, it was Christmas Eve. I was sitting at this panel and the light came in just in the right way that I saw right at my eye level a petroglyph of a hummingbird that I hadn't seen before. So when you think you know these panels, you don't. Return again and again, and they'll tell different stories. In those, those uh, first, that first year of the, the pandemic, the, the, uh, my kids didn't go to school, which I was pretty excited about because we could go out. And, and uh, my, my son Jado and I went to Escalana, Utah and, uh, and rented a, a tent space that had Wi-Fi in town so that he could do his homework. And every morning I would leave the tent and he, he was asleep in there and I would drive out a dirt road and go up to a rock art panel. One that was pretty well known and has is, is got a lot of graffiti and, and historic names, ranchers' names on it that are scrawled across the top of, of these red pictographs. And I would sit there in the stars and look at this blank black panel because it was dark. I wouldn't use a headlamp getting up there because I wanted my eyes to adjust. And when that first band of indigo formed across the horizon, the images started to come out of the rock. And that's when I learned that the rock is not single dimension. It's not just one flat plane. It's something that is deep. You could, it feels like you could stand up and walk into it, or as if the pictographs were standing up and walking out of it. And I found that for about 20 minutes in that first light, all the graffiti was invisible. And all I could see were those pictographs, red images of people holding hands and thunder gods with implements in their hands, a flute player, smudges of thumbprints maybe representing rain. And for those first 20 minutes on that first day, I thought, oh, the graffiti's gone. And I'm prone to thinking magically. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'm in a different time. It actually it was all erased because I couldn't see it at all. All I could see were these, these ancient images coming out, and this is the way they were supposed to be seen. This was the beginning of time, it felt like. And then after the 20 minutes passed, the light got brighter, and the graffiti started coming out, and the scratch marks, and the, and the historic names, and then it became the panel that I knew. And every morning I would go out for four mornings, to watch this happen, to watch this first light shine through these images, this sunrise happening on this rock on the Colorado Plateau. Sunrise on the Colorado Plateau.
land is a marker. Buttes stand like faraway thongs. Mesa edges cut sharply against the sky. A crack in a boulder lets sunrise through and a dagger of light lands on a spiral. If there was any question about order in the universe, the answer is out in the open for all to see. Every year comes back to the same place. Put a quarter in the slot and the ride starts again. The shadow of our mesa drew across a broad upslope to the south. The moon lost its brightness as it lowered in the west. Mesa shadows stretched like exclamation marks. Watching the sundial move was not like sitting with a grandfather clock in a living room where time seems binary, ticking back and forth. Here, time felt fluid, pouring over a sparse canopy of pinion and juniper, washing between mesas as if a flood had let loose. This crack in the boulders channeled some of that flood, tightening it into a long point of light. The boulder's face and the rising sun formed an oblique angle that hurried the sun's movement as if the spin of the earth had quickened. 5.36 a.m. The light passed across two turns of the spiral, steadily moving toward the third and the fourth. 5.37 a.m. The light reached the fifth circle and a minute later the sixth. 5.39 a.m. Bullseye. The tip of the sundial, the size of a 50 cent piece, fit perfectly into a circle, a shallow cupule pecked into the center of the spiral. For a handful of seconds, the alignment seemed fastened, as if two planes intersected and held on to each other as long as possible, cherishing their contact. 5.40 a.m., the sundial moved beyond the center, touching the next spiral arm. By 5.44, it passed through the entire spiral and was coming out the other side of the 13th arm. After that, it continued across the boulder and off its edge, the sundial becoming a lance, the lance widening to become full daylight. To, to make a book of definitions and meanings, what rock art means. I mean, I've seen books that say wavy lines mean this, straight lines mean that, spirals mean this other thing, and, and I never thought it was so simple. When, when I uh, talked to a Hopi man about spirals, I said I was, I was writing about spirals and I wanted to get his opinion. He said, oh, spirals, that's a whole book. Like, where would you even begin? Because spirals define anything that whirls, anything that twists and comes back to about the same place where it started over and over again, which means water, which means wind, which means migrations of people moving across the land, traveling in circles that come back not to the same place exactly, but to the same general idea. And I was told by a man at Zuni that the spiral represents your life, 
that you are always moving toward the center place, which is the same as your civilization, which is the same as wind, as water. And I think it was that way a thousand years ago. If you had come and, and asked people, what does this mean? One person would have said, oh, this is, this is a representation of ancestors. And another person would say, no, no, that's, it's not that bad. It's this other thing. It, it represents water. And somebody else would have said, I hate it when they draw on rocks. <laughs> I don't think that they were that different long ago. Rock art doesn't just have one meaning. Everything means something different. I tried to avoid uh, giving meaning to certain figures, but there were, I, in this book you'll, you'll find that, that I'm looking at the, the figures, if you've seen them around the Colorado Plateau, who have ducks on their heads. So I go back and I find the stories about ducks on heads that are, that are recorded at Zuni, and I'm talking to Zuni people about about these images, where they come from. Or maybe you've seen so many figures, big human-like figures with, with little, a little human-like figure on its shoulder. What does that mean? I try to define it in this book, but also saying that it, these meanings have, have been passed down for thousands of years or for centuries, and they've changed over time. But one thing I came to is that it was hard not to name this book after rain or after water, but I already wrote House of Rain and Secret Knowledge of Water, so I couldn't reuse those titles. <laughs> but everything out here is about rain. Everything on the Colorado Plateau. Without rain, you don't have the hunt. You don't have birth. You don't have ceremony. It is all about clouds and rain. I was talking to a, a Zuni farmer and weaver. He weaves the... Uh, the rain sashes that are that are used in the ceremonial dances, and and he, he told me how exhausting it is to be Zuni because you're always in charge of the clouds. So he said, you go to bed and you think about clouds and rain. You wake up, you're thinking about clouds and rain. The ceremonies and the songs, what are they about? Clouds and rain. And when the and a lot of the interviews in this book, uh, because of uh, because we were in lockdown had to be by Zoom or, or phone. And I talked to this, this one Zuni farmer weaver quite a bit across those, that year and a half of writing this book. And, and the, in April of, of 2020, we were talking about the, the rains that were gonna, we were talking about the monsoons that, that everyone hopes for in the summer. And he said, he said you know, we're, we're not doing the dances this year. Uh, everything's canceled. All the Pueblos have, are not doing ceremonies. And he said, it's not going to be a good year because we can't make clouds. And maybe you remember that summer of 2020 when it was so dastardly dry. And he, I, I called him, I think it was in August, and and I was in Colorado, and, I, and he said, so how's it looking up there? And I said, well, there's not a cloud in the sky, and it smells like wildfire, wildfires, so you know what it's like. How is it looking down in Zoom, Zuni? And he, he said, yeah, the just blue, blue sky, nothing up there. But wait, there, there are two little clouds, he said. Two, two little clouds coming this way. And I said, well, what do they look like? And he said, well, well that one looks like my uncle. <laughs> and I... <laughs> I said, your uncle, well, tell me more. And he said, well, my uncle is always out at sheep camp. He doesn't come in really. He, and that's his buddy next to him. And they're just, they're just coming across, they're just walking, and, and they don't come in for ceremonies, and they don't really, they're not part of this. And so that's like my uncle, he's not gonna rain. He's not gonna bring us anything. And that's, I, I was talking to, uh, to Carol Patterson, and. Uh, ethnographer uh, down in, in Bluff and uh, who has gone through a lot of the old ethnography, especially from Zuni, and, and she said, you know, you, you look at these figures and you have to step back a thousand years or two thousand years and, and think of the animistic culture that was here, the animism being everything is alive, it's all people. Ant people, thunder people, mountain people, cloud people. Everything is alive and you can talk to it, interact with it. And she said the thing you'd want to be interacting with is the clouds. And I think you understand that. 
when you're looking at clouds in the summer and going, are you going to come over here? Are you going to rain? Are you one of those? That the clouds all have personalities. They have names. And she said, so you're looking at a rock art panel and you're seeing what you would call an anthropomorph. You would call it a person. A person with, with a chest and shoulders and a head and arms. And she said, these, these aren't necessarily people. These are clouds. And I talked to people at Hopi and Zuni who said the same. Who said, when you see these images, they may remind you of people, but they are cloud people. And so now I look at some of these panels, like the, there's a big panel along the San Juan River of, of these broad-shouldered, almost human-sized figures with heads. And, and I used to see shamans or, or spirit people, and now I look at them and I go, is that just a storm coming this way? Full of lightning and thunder, full of rain coming out of them? You would draw clouds a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago, not like the puffy clouds we draw now, but like people that you would talk to. When the ceremony started up again at Zuni that next summer, I was talking to the uh, the weaver farmer down in the down in the Zuni Mesa, and and uh, and he he said, "Oh yeah, it's happening." The dances are back and it's raining. And you remember last summer? You remember those storms? Every canyon from where I lived in Colorado out to Zion was flooded. Huge floods, bridges blowing out, so much debris flashing into the desert. Those rains came hard. And he said when they're dancing on the mesa and it's raining, they just get louder and louder with the drums and the dancing and the rain and the thunder, inviting it, calling it. And I called him that summer and I said, how's it looking down there? And he said, well, the roads are washing out and the fields are being drowned and people's houses are being flooded. And I said, do you ever think of asking it to slow down a little? And he said, no, no, you never, ever ask for the rain to stop, ever. And so as I wrote this book, I looked at these different features. I looked at clouds and hunts. I looked at what these stories could be, not from one perspective, but from many different voices. I sh shine a light on rock art from obsessed rock art professionals, archaeologists, Hopi, Zuni, Diné, Ute. And I looked at the handprints on the walls, going back into an alcove and seeing hundreds of handprints where they had painted their palms and fingers and pushed them against the rock. And those were not like the cloud people. Those were like us, the people people, the humans who left their handprints on the cloud, on the, on the rock, telling the story of themselves. And every handprint you see, you realize is a name, is a person, is somebody from back then.
glass says human more than this, more than the hand and the fingers. So many alcoves, I went into the back and saw them painted red, green, blue, yellow, white. And every one of those hands to me says rain. Every one of them says clouds. Without clouds, without rain, there are no people. We have known that from the beginning. All of us who have ever lived in the desert know that. Rain means life. Rain is the only way to survive out here. You pray to it. You watch the clouds rise. You talk to the clouds. You quietly wait for them. And when they come full of thunder, full of wind, when you smell that coming off of them, that smell that just fills your body, the rain pouring down, covering you, running through the canyons, raising the rivers, that's what we look for here. Every one of those hands is there because it rained. The lakes rise. The rivers rise. The clouds come. And every time it rains, you step outside, you open your mouth, and you drink. sunrises you can see forever the land is a grand staircase cliffs step down to buttes and into canyons light falls into shadow with so much iron rusting in the rock the entire horizon is red 
Towers in the distance stand like water gods. From up here, the head of all the cliffs, it feels like you can see half of the Colorado Plateau. First sun lands on her pecked face as if waking her. The light climbs down her body. She is a petroglyph and she looks over everything. The land in front of her open as if a sea has parted. Her hair is rendered in the twin whorls known historically among Hopi women. Her figure is as slender as a tuning fork, her age a thousand and a half years at least. Cleanly pecked legs are slightly apart to let through a golden-headed bundle where she is giving birth. As the sun moves down her legs, it illuminates the infant. When I look out and see rock art, I see ancestry. I see names and clans going back so far into the past. And it's odd to be there as someone who doesn't share the language or the ancestry, somebody who arrived here only recently. I am from the Southern New Mexico Motorhead Clan of Roswell, New Mexico. That's where my family is from. They had the Roswell Body Shop. That is my ancestry. My, my great-grandfather taught range management at Sol Ross College in the Big Bend Desert of West Texas. My lineage here is so thin, layered on top of such deep lineage going back into the Ice Age. And sometimes while writing this book, I wondered what right do I have to be doing this? How odd it is to be looking at someone else's ancestry on these walls to try to understand it, but then how else would you live in a place? You would come to a place and look for the oldest sign. You would go to the oldest people. You would go to those who have seniority and ask them, what is this? Where have I ended up? Yes, it's been a rocky, crazy, genocidal history, and here we are now. Just Monday, I was standing with a, with a Hopi man and a Diné woman in Blanding, Utah, and I had that familiar thought. I've been with, I've stood with the Hopi and the Diné and me in the same place and just looked at, we looked at each other and go, huh, here we are. What's the chance? This has come to pass. I've been out reading these signs in the rock, looking for ancestry trying to understand what the oldest languages are here, listening to Hopi, listening to Zuni. When I talked to one Zuni man about the, some of these figures, he said, oh, these are, these are spirit beings. And I said, well, what is, what is a spirit being? What is the word spirit? And he, and he gave me a word in Zuni to, uh, to define spirit. And it was, it was a long, complex word that I was trying to spell out, and I had to have him repeat it seven times, and all I could do in the end was count that there are 19 syllables in this one word. And the syllables sounded like shells rattling down a stream, pouring over each other. And I said, can you help me spell that? And he said, spell it? You mean in English? No, <laughs> it doesn't translate. I said, okay, well, what does this word mean? And he said, well, I guess the closest word in English would be raw, that these are raw beings. And he said that a raw being is, humans are closest to it when they're born and when they're dying. And in between where we are, we're cooked. <laughs> we're kind of hard, we're baked. <laughs> But for those moments on either side, you're raw. And some of these images that we were talking about, images with enlarged hands and feet, they were the raw ones. The ones who passed between boundaries where the rock wasn't just rock, it was something that you could reach through and something where the rock art reached back to us. And here we are now, the ones who are living on this land. All of us, Diné, Ute, European, Asian, African, so many people here now. This is where you are. You're that thin veneer on top. You are the next story to be told. This is 
uh, Now Is the Time to Be Alive, which is a song they wrote based on Everett Roos's letters and journals. Everett Roos disappeared in the deserts uh, in the 1930s. say one last thing here tonight and that's that when this when this book first came to mind I considered it taking to taking it to uh, one of the large publishers in New York and then I realized that's not what I was doing here 
I wanted to write a book for us, for the people of this landscape. And I knew what would happen if I went to New York. I could hear the agent going, okay, well, this has to be much bigger. This, you need to go all the way to Mexico with this, and we need some East Coast, and we need uh, the Northwest, and we need to get rock art from, from uh, Southeast Alaska. And, and I, could, I could hear the editor saying, okay, can you explain this again? So you, you walk, right? You put stuff on your back and walk around. And, and I didn't want to have to explain all of that. I wanted to go to the people of this landscape and say, all right, we already know what's going on here. We know the Colorado Plateau and the canyons and how this works. Let's dive in. And that's what this book was for me, was a dive, plunging into rock art that I've been looking at for most of my life. Growing up in, in Arizona and going to the, the tops of the buttes in Phoenix and seeing spirals and snakes, I wanted to talk to people who knew this already, who knew what was around them. And so I went to Tory House Press, knowing that they are the voice of this place, a voice of this place, which is why it's so nice to come to Ken Sanders as well, people who know this landscape, when I say rock art, an image comes into your head. I don't know if it's a spiral or a handprint, a raw being on a rock, but it is something that you've seen. What you've seen is the light in this place. The light that grows in these canyons in the morning, that in the summer turns the rock panels silver and bright, and right before sunset, the rock becomes molten. This is a book about light and following it, tracing the stories that light tells as it lands on figures and traces them out. This is a book for you, for us, for the people who know these canyons and know this light, the light that we bask in. So I'm gonna ask Kate to carry us away. Thank you, Craig. It's been lovely here on stage to share the evening with you. And I'm going to close with a song. Uh, I wrote this maybe perhaps 20 years ago or so. And uh, it's on my latest recording, Uranium Maiden, which is uh, the last song I just sang is also on there. And these are songs that I've written about the region here, about Utah, and, and all kinds of things about Utah. So, but this is a more personal one. This is about being in one place for a long time. So thank you all for coming. We're, I'm gonna end with enough time to go have some wine. Let me shut the bar down.
Leonardo. Uh, downstairs at the bookstore, there's wine and beer, and Kate and Craig will be happy to meet with you, sign CDs, books, or just have a conversation. Please join us downstairs.